social relations, specifically the behavioral interactions between organisms that live in a social group. Well, what isn't a social group? Well, ugh, this cactus. This cactus is a completely asocial organism. It will live its entire life without interacting with another of its species. I purchased it in 2006, and it has never met another of the same species. And in, yeah, it's quite a while. You see it flowers, but it doesn't actually encounter any other pollen from its same species, so it'll never have sex and never set seed. And if you think that's not a very large cactus for being so old, well, that's because I filmed this lecture in 2007. Just kidding. Um, that's because this cactus is actually a clone of the original. So it will bud off at the base, and then I can take those buds and move them to a new location. Ah. Social organisms, however, need to take care of their offspring. And they often do so in the context of other organisms of the same species being a social group. And that's what social really is. Organisms living together and taking care of offspring, or at least for the benefit of the offspring. Fitness, we will define today if we haven't already. Uh, assessment is a key component of this lecture, as is sexual selection, and if you're not yet familiar with it, a nuptial gift. Be able to list, and well, you should probably be able to define, mating systems. List different methods of assessment and give examples. Differentiate between intrasexual and intersexual selection. List costs and benefits to sexual selection, and list the costs and benefits to nuptial gifts. This is better covered in your book. So social behavior starts with, well, sex. Sex, mating, social life. Most animals must meet to mate. As you saw, there's a plant there that doesn't need to meet a different organism of the same species to mate. It can be forever alone. Some animals are going to be sticking together even if they are not mating. And apparently here, drinking and sharing milkshakes in very close proximity to one another. Oh, how times have changed. <laughs> That's terrifying. All right. <laughs> a lot of mate choice is about assessment and it's about resources. And honestly... I'd say it's about female choice. It's not always about female choice. It's often about um, just whichever has a, you know, more investment into the mating system. It's relative cost of sperm and eggs. Now, there is out there a fly species that only produces two sperm at a time. Now, that fly has to, uh, has to really be careful about where it's going to mate because if it mates with a female, the sperm cost more than the egg. So in that case, the male must be more choosy, choosy. But in birds, in reptiles, and in most mammals, the female choice is going to occur because eggs are inherently bigger than sperm. And especially in placental mammals, they actually will carry the offspring for a long period of time. Now fish, they can go either way too, because um, although the egg is generally bigger than the sperm, there are fish out there where the male is going to be taking care of the offspring and thus investing more. So really think about it in terms of investment and in terms of optimality. A female, if investing more, is going to be choosier than a male. Um, there is There are species out there that are hermaphroditic as well. So there is a species of hermaphroditic flatworms. And you think, well, how do they choose a mate? Well, the organism that is female in the mating ends up providing more resources. So they actually will compete to be male. Okay, so how do two hermaphrodites compete to take the role of male? Well, they have an external penis, and their penis is going to inject sperm through the body cavity of the other one. Now, if a flatworm gets injected with sperm, it has become female in that mating. But if the flatworm manages to inject the other flatworm with sperm, then it becomes male in that interaction. And whichever flatworm is male invests less resources and can do more mating. So how does a flatworm get to be male in a mating system here? Well, 
They fight with their penises. It's called penis fencing. Don't look it up. There are other things there. But basically, the males will try to inseminate each other. And whichever one inseminates the other first invests fewer resources. And that is a terrifying example of um, how this mate choice actually depends on the resources involved. Now, there are different mating systems. And I want to look at each mating system as optimal mating. So optimal foraging is getting the most resources per unit energy expended. Mating is no different. It's an optimal fitness. Whichever organism gets the highest fitness for that mating is going to be um, doing the best. So um, here are the different mating systems with monogamy. Do, 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 do. Monogamy. It's a one-to-one. -one. And what that will generally mean is that there is an equal allocation of resources by the male and by the female. Uh, take, for example, the penguin. So a penguin will have the female lay a resource-heavy egg. The male will then watch over that egg for the winter, and as the male incubates the egg during the winter, the male loses a lot of resources. So the female donates a lot of resources. The male donates a lot of resources. The chick hatches just in time for the female to return and give food to the chick. The male will then leave, go get food for the chick, come back, trade off. And this trading off equal allocation of resources gives rise to monogamy. So if it's resource allocation there, then that's going to be more optimal for, for a monogamous relationship. And often that is when the offspring requires resources from both parents. We'll return to that a little later in this lecture. Next is polygyny. So, well, Polly, let's actually, in your notes there, it's going to be right. Polygamy is multiple marriages, and there are three forms of polygamy. First is, the one we think of, is polygyny. When the male resources are low, but the female resources are high in the, what they give to an offspring, a male may mate with several females. And in this case, the male does not need to contribute a lot of resources to have fitness with multiple females, but the female has to uh, choose a very good male. So what we're also going to see pairing with polygyny is female choice. Then there's polyandry. Think andro, andre, android. That means a male, so many males. There's where well, there are several males to a single female. If the male is taking care of the eggs, then a female can lay eggs with multiple males. Uh, seahorses would be an example of this. If the female can deposit her eggs on a male seahorse, the male seahorse will take care of those eggs. And when those eggs hatch, the female can deposit more eggs on that male. So really the Offspring laying is limited by how fast the eggs can be produced. And if a female, hypothetically, could produce a batch, a clutch of eggs every other day, but it took a male six days to raise the eggs, then a female could be um, laying eggs on three different males and just going in a cycle. And that would be an example of polyandry because the male is investing more resources than the female. You would expect to see male choice in this matter. More complex is polygyandry. Polygyandry is several males and several females. Now, this is not just an orgy. This is pair bonds, but a more complex system of pair bonds, where maybe several brothers and several sisters are mating across those lineages. So a male may have two females, another male may have one female, the males are related, the females are related, and thus their offspring are related. And this is kind of the pack or um, pride kind of mentality where we have perhaps lionesses which are related and two lions which are related, and they are going to be uh, mating and producing cubs, and the cubs 
are now related to their dad and their uncle, their mother, and their aunt. So being related to all four of them, all four of those adults will take care of the cub. Way to go, Simba. There's also promiscuity. Not so much a pair bonding system as a lack of a pair bonding system. This is when all the male donates is sperm. Just that. <coughs> just inseminate and leave. Don't even call me later. Just that's it. And what happens here is the male is often extremely um, ornamented or has extremes in behavior. And the female is choosing the best male from a veritable buffet of males. And when this veritable buffet of males is laid out in an area, it's called a lek, L-E-K. It's where a female will go for mating, but nothing else. This is not mate and also get some food. This is not mate near the watering hole. This is just, here is a space for the female to go pick a male, mate with, and then have no more relations with. So the male here has no role in raising offspring except donating sperm. And that can be optimal to a, uh, to a female if that's really all they need. It just takes one to raise the offspring. If it only takes one, then it's probably going to be the female. So when I start talking about assessment and choice and one is favorite over the other, this can mean that some males will mate and some males will not. Some females will mate, some females will not. And those that do not have lower fitness. Those that do not survive have lower natural selection, or lower, lower fitness by natural selection. Those that do not mate have lower fitness by sexual selection. So let's take a female and think about some hypotheses about why it would mate with this rough grouse. So the rough grouse here has these chest patches, and these chest patches are relatively devoid of feathers. They need to be inflated to show off, and the tail feathers need to be held, held erect. They need to, the male needs to get its own space upon the prairie for its mating dance to be clear of other males, and they have this very specific mating ritual. So why would a female choose a rough grouse that is able to do all of those specific mating rituals. Well, the ruffed grouse that has, the male ruffed grouse that has the best species specific mating ritual is going to be the one that best appropriates what it is to be a ruffed grouse. The ones that have maybe the wrong number of steps to the side or the wrong type of booming voice or a quieter booming sound, they are simply not as rough grouse. They're not as close to that ideal. And the female wants the rough grouse that best appropriates what that species is. Because getting that perfect target ensures that they're not accidentally mating with some other species. So that's possibly one reason for a really uh, intense mating display. And that's also the reliability of the signal. So how well does that display um, kind of talk about how fit the male is. So the male that has these chest pouches without any uh, parasites on it, well, that is, uh, that is a fit male. That is a male that has survived natural selection quite well. The male that doesn't have half of its tail feathers that have been chewed away by a coyote is a male that is clearly able to avoid coyotes. So all of these bits of signals are the male rough grouse saying, look, I have good genes. I am a good rough grouse. If you mate with me, then you get these genes for your offspring. You get good baby rough grouse. Look at my booming pectoral muscles. You know, look at my feathers. I am a good rough grouse. I have good genes, no parasites. That's good. Female wants that. And if all she's getting is sperm, it better be the best sperm around. A male that's able to maintain more territory is another good example. So the rough grouse here that has the best, most sunlit, free from weeds, and largest area 
obviously is the best between males. That is intra-sexual selection. Males competing against each other for the optimal territory. That is the best male according to fights among males. And that's why a female may prefer that male over others. Is obviously between men is the best. Then there's a handicap hypothesis that if a ruffed grouse has these chest patches, it has to keep them free of parasites, and that's harder. Mosquitoes will go right for those chest patches. So the male that can afford to expose its skin in the mosquito swarming summer is obviously able to take on that handicap and still survive. So the red cardinal, that is uh, the reddest, is the best at avoiding falcons who can easily see it. And that's the idea that, a ha that these signals actually show off some sort of a handicap for the male. If the male can live with that handicap and still be alive, they must have a lot of other good genes. Staying free of parasites must mean a good immune system. So displaying one's ability to stay parasite free is really displaying the immune system that the handicap of having bare chest plates entails. Then there's a sexy sons hypothesis that this rough grouse, if good, if this rough grouse is good at attracting females, then his male offspring will be good at attracting females. That can lead to something called runaway sexual selection, where the female just wants the male that is best at attracting females. It can detach sexual fitness from natural selection fitness, like the handicap hypothesis connects sexual fitness with natural selection fitness. But the sexy son's hypothesis can lead to a bit of a disconnect where the traits that will attract the female don't necessarily mean that male's got anything else going for him. But usually there's a blend of all of these. There is probably a rough grouse out there that has a perfect mating ritual. If the signal is uh, showing they have good genes, uh, the territory is maintained well, they're able to maintain this reliable signal even in the face of the signal itself giving them a handicap, and they're going to produce good offspring. So all five of these can be absolutely correct. They're just different ways of looking at sexual selection. Now, the female that does sexual selection will be assessing the male. This assessment can take on a bunch of different things. First off would be rituals. Check out a blue-footed booby mating ritual. So you'll see they flap their blue feet around. Well, that flapping of blue feet tells the female that this is the right species of booby. A red-footed booby that does a red-footed booby dance in front of a blue-footed booby female is going to be showing that it is the wrong type of booby. So the blue-footed booby showing off its big blue feet, that's a good mating ritual showing that, yes, it's the right species. Also showing that in, able, in order to get that blue color, they have to have a very good, strong body. In order to survive away from predators, when they have that, those blue feet, they're more susceptible to predators. So in order to maintain those blue feet, they have to be, uh, they have to be a pretty strong booby. So this is a good mating ritual because it gives a lot of information about the male. Then there are uh, nuptial gifts. The scorpion fly is an example of a nuptial gift. He brings the female a prey that they have captured. Now this does actually indicate that the male is capable of capturing prey. Uh, more proximally, it is nutrition that can increase the amount of eggs that are laid. So by feeding the female, the female can produce more eggs, and the bigger the gift that the male can offer, the more that the female will actually increase his fitness by laying more eggs that have been inseminated by him. There are those who say, if a man wants to get a date, get a dog. Take care of a dog. Maintain a dog groom the dog. This is under the theory that um, female humans are going to be looking at a male's ability to maintain and keep a dog as an indicator of parental care. There's also a much better example with the puffin. A puffin, a type of bird, 
is going to go and capture, the male puffin will go and capture small fish and present these small fish to the female. And this female will see these small fish and go, that is, that is some, I know that's a quality male. Why small fish? Well, the male will be feeding the, the offspring, at least in part. The female does her job. They have to capture small fish to feed these offspring. Now, if a male were to go back and bring back a full salmon, that's a great male. I mean, very strong, very good, good puffin. But you can't feed a whole salmon to a baby puffin. What about a whole mackerel? Holy mackerel, you can't feed a whole mackerel to a baby puffin. What about a little red herring? Well, that might be a bit misleading, but yes, a little red herring can be fed perfectly to a baby puffin. So the male puffin will bring these little tiny fish and show this as part of its mating ritual, and the female will assess the male's ability to care for offspring. Territory. So a deer that has a good territory, a buck that can defend his turf. Let's say uh, you have you have uh, a buck that can hold on to St. Martin's whole campus, that this buck is trotting back and forth, its magnificent antlers held high and chasing away any other males. Well, the male deer, the male, yeah, male deer, buck, that can hold on to the entirety of St. Martin's campus and defend it against all comers, that's a good territory. And the territory of St. Martin's campus is the perfect place for raising fawns. I mean, have you seen how many fawns get raised on St. Martin's campus? It's a lot. There are a lot of baby deer at St. Martin's. So obviously this is a high quality territory and the male that is able to have this territory is going to be providing an environment that is suitable for the female. Appearance. Now we discussed some things that may be reasons for appearance, be it the sexy sun's hypothesis, or be it the uh, reliability of a signal or a species-specific signal. This is why appearance can be very important. Now, as a very ugly man myself, I, I prefer to say that I, I like it when a woman likes an ugly man because uh, you'll all become ugly as you get older. Uh, beauty is fleeting. So appearance, uh, you know, speaking like Drax, it's good to be loved when you're ugly because then they, you know they love you for who you are, not how you look. But when it comes to, you see, talking about animals mating, yeah, appearance does matter. <laughs> and last is imprinting. So, a turkey was raised by humans. And what was interesting about this turkey is that it, um, it liked men, it liked to hang around men, and enjoyed the presence of men, the company of men, but a woman that showed up in a dress, especially a wide dress, the turkey would go ballistic and attack her. Because the turkey, it had imprinted on humans and it had lived with humans, so it believed it was a human. Now, it would see this woman coming at it with a wide dress into the turkey's mind. That was a turkey coming at it with its feathers down, trying to do a uh, threat display. The turkey believed he was fighting off another male turkey every time he assaulted a woman in a dress. This is an example of imprinting that the animal will actually take after what it needs as an offspring. They didn't, uh, there was some scientists who did a good experiment with this, giving birds little hats. They give a little hat to the male and females that were raised by a male with a hat would find a, another male that had a hat to be more attractive than a male without a hat. So giving hats to birds changed the female preference for birds with hats. Why? Because the female was raised by a male with a hat, then that male with a hat must be the same species, and males without hats must be a different species. There's also a tendency of imprinting for the behavior and preferring the behavior of one's parents compared to the behavior of some other, because again, species specific Signal. All right. These are methods of assessment. Let's change gears a little bit and moves on to harems, packs, and territories. Hey, sea lion, do you have a lot of females? Yeah. Can't you hair them? Uh, yes, I can hair all of them. So, harems are large groups of the opposite sex. So, take the example of the elephant seal. Um, 
if you look at this graph right here, what it's showing is actually the body length between the male and the female. So the bigger the male compared to the female, the more you actually have a male defending a large territory against all comers. Think of the elephant seal again. Um, it is a very large male compared to a smaller female. And what's going to happen here is the male is going to maintain this territory and the females will live in this territory. And the bigger the male, the more it can fight away other males. So that's the male's size indicates its, uh, its sexual fitness, really. Maintaining territories can be done by a group. So if two lions, so what's, what's stronger than a lion? Well, two lions. So sometimes two lions will actually, uh, brothers especially, live together and fight off single male lions. Now this one lion will be dominant over the other, but they'll both mate with the females. And that's, again, an example of polygyandry. And these two male lions will, uh, or three or four, form a pride. Now, you can also have packs of animals where, depending on their genetic relatedness, they may actually gain fitness from the alpha male and alpha female having an offspring because that offspring is related to them. So a complex social structure forms between different organisms um, when some are mating but some are not and they're just doing the job of protecting. It really comes down to the needs of the offspring. What type of social group exists depends on the offspring. Most mammals are polygynous. The female provides milk. The female maintains the offspring for a lengthy period of time. Mammals are mostly live bearers. So these females are going to be the ones who are going to be investing more resources. This means you have a polygynous mating system and generally sexual selection is based on female choice. Birds, often two parents are needed for protection or for food. So the blue-footed booby, both parents are needed. The penguin, both parents are needed. Uh, most passerine birds, your little finches and whatnot, both parents are needed. Thus, a monogamous relationship is optimal. For birds, so, sorry, for frogs and fish and some birds, there are only needing one parent. So if there's only one parent needed and it's a male, as, as ma a male it's polyandry. If a, one parent is needed, it's a female, you get polygyny. And if you get one parent and, well, it's female, but the male is really not needed, then it can be promiscuity. The mating systems are directly related to how the offspring are cared for, and the social systems are going to be directly related to how the offspring are cared for. Take meerkats, for example. I mean, it takes a, takes a meerkat village to properly raise a clutch of meerkats. So these larger systems are also ultimately driven by the needs of the offspring. And this can lead to, uh, to tribes, to, uh, to colonies, to prides, depending on what kind of offspring um, needs there are, that's going to determine what kind of social group there are. So the basis of all social relationships is really what do the offspring need? So I want you to take a turn. I'm going to design two species. So using these terms, uh, behavioral ecology, fitness, altruism, sexual selection, nuptial gifts, social and use social organisms. I put a comma there. You can use other terms if you want. Um, and I know you don't know all these terms from this lecture video alone. I, I want you to refer to the book and I want you to look these up. And I want you to get some good examples. So make two species. So I uh, make, make them up. Have some fun. I don't know. Make lizards. I don't care. Just have a social lizard. Why, why not? I can give some reasons why not, but how about you? Can you? Give me a non-social species. Uh, is there sexual selection? Male on female? Female on male? What is it? Uh, how is the assessment done? Give me some care of offspring. And I really want you to make these up and just, uh, just email me. I'm not sure if I'll put a Moodle forum for this. I mean, I wouldn't mind getting some random species in my, uh, my inbox that you made up. Be creative. But keep to the actual rules of uh, social relations. It has to be a realistic assessment. Is it a ritual, a gift, a care, territory, appearance, imprinting? Um, is, is the mating dance very species specific or does, uh, does it have to, uh, well, it should be actually, but um, give me some examples and some rationale behind your species. I really look forward to seeing what you make.